Thank you very much for the invitation to Aerogen to talk about uh, the, the latest scientific evidence on the high flow nasal therapy during the management of COVID-19 patients. These are my disclosures and this is more or less the summary of my talk or the main things that we are going to talk about. The first thing is the latest evidence uh, on the use of high flow. And as you probably know, the, the, the evidence about its use is rapidly growing. And if you make a simple search on PubMed and you only write high flow nasal cannula or nasal high flow, you will see that the number of papers is exponentially, exponentially growing since the first publication in adults in 2010. And indeed, almost 500 papers were published uh, last year. This led to uh, the publication of the uh, consensus uh, of expert panels that could be uh, summarized in this very nice figure according to the different grades of recommendation in different clinical situations. And as you can see, in case of the hypoxemic respiratory failure, there were strong recommendation of its use and it was clearly uh, superior to conventional oxygen when we assess the intubation rates of both techniques. But what happens with high flow use during COVID-19 pandemic? Well, uh, if we look to the physiological effects of high flow, we could think that it would be also useful in COVID-19 patients. All the effects of, of high flow are flow dependent and uh, are very well described, but we have to, uh, to have to bear in mind that the relative contribution of each of these mechanisms is unknown and may vary from one patient to another one. But there are also on the other side of the, of the coin a lot, of, uh, a lot of, of different concerns that initially limit uh, its use in COVID-19 patients mainly related with the aerosolization and spread of the virus particles that may increase transmission of the infection to healthcare workers. The fact that high flow could delay intubation and initiation of mechanical ventilation and the fact that this delay could be associated with uh, an excessive respiratory drive that may aggravate the pre-existing lung injury. And if we go to the recommendations that initially were done by different societies, uh, we had or we find that there were sometimes controversy and no positive. Uh, some, some societies recommends for its use and other even recommends, uh, sorry here, against its use. But the real life is that when we ask to the to the physicians what they do, or what they did during the, during the pandemic, most of patients who present a mild respiratory failure were treated using high flow at least at the, at the beginning of the disease. And it is clearly reflected that the, the, the use of high flow and non-invasive ventilation increased during the first wave. And interestingly, while increase, it also decreased the need of invasive mechanical ventilation and anti-day mortality. I'm not saying, of course, that this increase is the cause that this decrease, but it surely may play some role. It's, it's not the only explanation because we have learned about the disease. We know the steroids work. We know that Maybe some other drugs does not have any effect and they also play a role in the decrease of the need of mechanical ventilation and the improvement in mortality. But for sure, the increase of the use of non-invasive supportive therapies may play, may play also uh, a role. And if we look to the, we go back to PubMed and we write high flow nasal cannula and COVID-19, the number of papers that have been published is also very, very, very important. In one year, more than 100 patients, 100 manuscripts were published in PubMed about this uh, issue. 
And this led to the incorporation of these non-invasive techniques and high flow and even awake proning uh, in the ma overall management of COVID-19 patients. And uh, they fill the gap between the use of conventional oxygen and the starting of invasive mechanical ventilation. And as I told before, we did, we, did the pandemic also make us to, to, to did things uh, that probably will get more slowly in other situation, which is like awake proning. Um, this leads to uh, e these aims to improve oxygenation and maybe uh, delay or maybe uh, make some patient to be rescued from intubation. And this also led to uh, very uh, interesting international collaborative uh, uh, meta trials that including control trials in order to have uh, as soon as we can uh, an answer for these uh, questions, in this case, if a weight product may be useful for COVID-19 patients. But uh, one may ask if high flow is really beneficial in COVID-19. We have some very interesting data, which is observational, but uh, all in the same direction. This is a study that was published by some of the five French centers that uh, matched uh, more than 100 patients that were treated with high flow with other 100 patients that were not treated with high flow. And they, see, they saw that high flow was associated with a reduced proportion of patients requiring invasive mechanical ventilation at day 28. And there were also no differences in mortality, which is more or less the same results that we found in other trials with non-COVID-19 that have been published before. And more recently, uh, we uh, can also find the results of a, a Spanish score that matched 61 patients that were treated with high flow and with other 61 patients that were directly intubated and as you can see, the use of high flow reduced the ICU length of stay because, in fact, only 38% of the patients treated with high flow needed to be intubated. Meanwhile, in the other group, all patients need to be uh, then intubated. And interestingly, when we compare those patients who fail on high flow with those patients who were early intubated, no difference in ventilator free days or ICU length of stays or in hospital mortality were observed, which suggests that the use of high flow is not deleterious in those patients who fail. But what about the fact that high flow could delay or make the intubation later and therefore may worsen the prognosis of the patients who fail? Well, it is well known that as happened with NAB, the late intubation with high flow may be associated with uh, an increase in mortality rates. But when we, when, when this hypothesis or this uh, fact was te tested in a large cohort of patients who were treated with high flow in six different ICUs in Atlanta with a high rate of needed intubation, there were no difference in mortality, uh, regardless, um, no difference in mortality depending on the time that the patient were intubated. And in the same way, there were no difference in the duration in, in, of the mechanical ventilation or the ICU stay. So it suggests that high flow should be um, or can be used safely, let's say, in COVID 19 patients uh, as well. But when we use it, we have to keep in mind that high, the, the, the benefit of high flow is because it interrupts the vicious circle of lung injury in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. If high flow cannot do that, is in those patients who are going to fail. So we need to closely monitor these patients and clearly predefine 
the intubation criteria that we are going to use once we start with the technique in order to not delay uh, the intubation in those patients who are going to fail. And I said before that close monitoring is a key issue. It's a key issue, and especially in COVID-19 patients, where silent hypoxemia has changed a little bit the way of expressing the uh, severity of this patient. One patient could be extremely hypoxemic with low work of breathing, at least apparently. And what is not clear is if this patient needs to be intubated or not at this point, or, or we have to uh, wait until the patient presents anything of respiratory uh, distress. In any case, there are a lot of variables that have been associated with high flow nasal cannula failure. And in this sense, we described a couple of years ago uh, the utility of the ROX index, which was defined as SpO2 and F the ratio of SpO2 and FiO2 with respiratory rate. And it outperformed the diagnostic accuracy of these two variables separately. In fact, the ROX index above 4.8 at 2, 6, and 12 hours was consistently associated with a lower risk of mechanical ventilation after adjusting for potential confounding. And we also define some uh, thresholds for failure who were extremely specific. So if we take the threshold for success and the threshold for, for failure, we will find a great reason. And the obvious question is what I have to do with those patients who are in the middle of the gray zone and my recommendation would be to reassess the ROCS index. You can easily reassess at the bedside at, the at any time that you want, and you will have a trend. If the delta ROCS is above one, uh, these patients is likely to success with high flow. And but in contrast, if the, is the, if the delta ROCS is below one or 0 0.5, uh, this patient is likely to fail on high flow. But the other important question is, OK, the ROX index may work, but what appears first? Uh, maybe it appears at the same time that the patient meet traditional criteria for intubation, and therefore there's no room for improvement in using ROX index. And this uh, figure tries to, uh, to show you that ROX index is earlier compared uh, to the traditional criteria. Here you have represented the percentage of patients that met the ROCS index criteria for intubation at different time points, but who had a respiratory rate below 35, which means that they didn't met, they didn't meet a respiratory criteria for intubation. And the obvious question is, Okay, these patients were not intubated because they didn't meet the respiratory rate criteria for intubation. And what happened with these patients at the end? Well, at the end, 90% of these patients were finally intubated. And if we had used the ROCS criteria, these patients would have been intubated earlier. And the other question is, okay, ROCS index works at two, six, and 12 hours, but is 12 hours a, a, a safe zone? We can expand this zone until 24 hours. What should we do? The only way to test it that we have is compare the mortality rates of uh, the relative risk of, re of death uh, of the patients who were intubated between 6 and 12 hours, 12 and 24 hours, 25 and 70 hours, and after three days, compare with a reference which was taken between, which was taken with the mortality rates of those patients who were intubated in the first six hours of treatment. And as you can see, at least during the first 12 hours, you are in the safe zone. There is no an increase of risk of death associated with the time of intubation. And because of that, we propose an algorithm that can be uh, perfectly applied at the bedside and added to the 
common sense that the traditional criteria for intubation don't use the ROPS index only for decision. Use the ROPS index to support the decision that you have already uh, seen or taken with the traditional uh, criteria in case that you have uh, any doubt. And as you can see, it is always the same. If you are below the threshold, consider to intubation. If you are in the gray zone, increase support and reevaluate the rocks. And if you are in the safe zone, in the safe zone, you only have to continue monitoring and go to the next step. This uh, algorithm is uh, is actually now tested in a randomized multicenter randomized control trial. We have included more than 20% of the patients in less than three months. We are quite happy for that. And I think that in the next month or maybe next year, we will be able to uh, answer if the ROPS index decreased the time to failure in those patients who are going to fail treated with high flow. And the obvious question is the ROPS index was described in pneumonia patients, but it works in COVID-19 patients. And we have several papers that demonstrate that ROPS index may also be useful to identify those patients who fail in COVID-19 patients. This, one, the, this is the first paper that we published with, with the group of Jan Damian Ricard that included uh, almost 50 patients. And as you can see, the threshold of, uh, uh, of failure was more or less the same that we have previously described in non-COVID-19 patients. But the story repeats again with, with uh, a Chinese paper that, that included one, more than 100 patients with a 40% more or less rates of failure. And they assess the diagnostic accuracy of different variables. As, and as you can see, the ROPS index is the variable that predicts better compared to oxygenation even with uh, SpO2 or PaO2, uh, and in the multivariate analysis, it was the variable that highly predicts the outcome of high flow nasal cannula in COVID-19 patients. And again, the threshold is more or less between around five, let's say. And it has been also reproduced, but going one step further, and they uh, describe a model of different variables, but if you look at the variables, the age, platelets, levels of IL-6, and again, the ROPS index with similar threshold, and in the score that they propose, the variable that has a more weight on deciding uh, the, 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 the risk of intubation was again the ROPS index. The threshold for the score that separates low risk and high risk patients is six points, and as you can see, even in the training and also in the validation core, the, the results were highly uh, reproducible. And um, another Chinese group with the collaboration of, of people from Toronto make another interesting retrospective multicenter study where they include a lot of patients, not only treated with high flow, but also with NIV, and they describe a uh, normogram uh, with different variables that uh, you can um, that you can use to obtain a failure risk score that predicts according to the number that you have in the total score the risk of failure. If you don't want to use the normal gram, you can also go to the, this website and you will have an online calculator that is also uh, useful. One of the other concerns that uh, was uh, very important, at least at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, was the question of the fugitive emissions uh, with high flow use and the possibility of the transmission of the viral infection to the healthcare workers. And before going to deeply to this to this issue, I would like to um, introduce three different terms that I will try to keep 
during the presentation. We understand that uh, virosol is generated by the patients during coughing, breathing, talking, or even loathing, uh, which is different from the medical aerosol, which is generated by the aerosol drug delivery devices. And we, uh, we define a fugitive emission as the medical aerosols release from aerosol device during patient expiration. Well, we will go from the, bench, from the bench to the bedside, and the first paper that I would like to show you is a, 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 an in vitro study that uh, um, was performed using a nasal cannula that was connected to a head model or a tracheostomy tube. Uh, with a simulated of adult and pediatric breathing profile. So two different um, interfaces and two different uh, breathing profiles. Medical aerosols were tested at two different distances as well. And what they observed is that as the flow rate increased, the fugitive emissions decrease. So increase the flow rate could increase the turbulence and impactive loss of aerosol within the tubing, which means that less aerosol is reaching the patient, and then less aerosol is available for inhalation or to be released as a fugitive aerosol. And if we go to the bedside and we look at this figure and see the different lung conditions, normal lung, my lung injury, and several lung injury, using high flow cannula, different flow rates, as you can see, in several lung injury, the emissions is practically this identical regardless the flow used. If we put this image into a figure, you can see that the exhale air dispersion distance with 60 liter per minute under a severe lung injury is even less than the one, sorry, that the one observed with normal lung at only 10 liters per minute. And if we compare high flow with conventional oxygen, the small exhale smoke dispersion is also lower regardless the flow used. But what happens with the patient when they are coughing? So, which is obvious, the distance of droplet dispersion from coughing increase with high flow by an average of half a meter. So an, another interesting study that supports the previous observation is that this that was recently published in the, in, in the Blue Journal using healthy volunteers in negative pressure rooms with different oxygen uh, delivery modalities and oxygen delivery modalities were not uh, related with the fact of increased aerosol generation, which is what, what it was related with an increased aerosol generation was the presence of coughing or the breathing. And one way to solve this, a very easy thing, just put a surgical mask on the top of the cannula and you will see how smoke dispersion clearly decreases, even practically disappears. This is a very a uh, nice study performed by Gili and Stefan Ehrman in, 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 in Chicago. They were they compare conventional oxygen and high flow and high flow versus high flow plus surgical mask, and they collect particle uh, at two different distances, one foot and three feet, and they observe that there were no difference in the particle that they collect between conventional cannula and high flow and placing a mask on COVID-19 patients during high flow nasal therapy reduced aerosol particle dispersion. And it is also interesting to see what happens when you place a mask on the top of the cannula, which is that saturation also improved and there is no clinically relevant rebreathing. Although this difference was statistically significant, moving from 32 to 34 was not clinically uh, significant. And therefore, the other question is, okay, we are talking about particles, but what about environmental bacterial contamination? And this is a study that compared high flow with conventional oxygen, looking for gram-negative bacteria. They place different 
petri dishes uh, at 0.4 meters or at one at one and a half meters from the patient nose, and they observed that high flow was not associated with an increased uh, air or contact surface contamination by either gram-negative bacteria or total bacteria. And this is in the same line that this study that did not find that environment control, environmental contamination was not associated with day of illness, ventilatory mode, aerosol generating procedures, or viral load. We made a little study trying to assess if the contamination with SARS-CoV-2 was higher with high flow compared with mechanical ventilation patients. We include five patients on high flow and five patients mechanically ventilated, and we collect up to 15 different samples where we uh, perform a PCR for SARS-CoV-2 and surprisingly all samples were negative because they were negative and we didn't know if the sample collection uh, procedure was correct or not. We include two more patients with two additional samples, one of their sampling and another sample inside, collected from inside of the high flow nasal cannula of the non-intubated patient. And this, this was the unique sample that was positive for SARS-CoV-2. In this sample, we inoculated Vero6 cells in order to see if the virus was active and infective, and no CPE was observed, suggesting that no infections of SARS-CoV-2 was found in any of the environmental samples collect. In fact, we already know for SARS-CoV-1 uh, SARS that high flow was not uh, associated with an increased risk of SARS transmission to healthcare workers. And this is another study that has been, that was done with SARS-CoV-2 where they assess the increase in symptomatic COVID-19 in infections after implementing a protocol that promote or encourage the use of high flow and NIV negative pressure groups. And could you imagine what would have happened in this pandemic without, without high flow? This is what they try to show, some uh, American researchers try to show using simulation models uh, that, from, that were tested from February 4 to November 1, so more than six months, looking at two different outcomes, the number of deaths and the days without any available ventilator. They analyzed different policies for use of high flow versus the scenario where high flow was completely unavailable. The final recommended policy was high flow for non-urgent and extubated patients and mechanical ventilation for non-urgent patients as early intubation when they have more than 10% of total mechanical ventilators capacity available. This is the policy that uh, had the lower number of deaths at the higher days without any available ventilator. And as you can see here in, a, in this model that simulates how which was the impact in five different American cities, they could save more than 5,000 lives. And if we go to a national level, this strategy result in between 10,000 and 4,000 fewer deaths when that compared if high flow were not available. And with a moderate national ventilator capacity, this strategy led up to 25 fewer days without available mechanical ventilator. And for an intermediate of hospital of 250 beds with 100 mechanical ventilator, the availability of 13, 20, and 33 high flow nasal cannula devices prevented up to 130 deaths. So I don't want to imagine what would have been the pandemic without high flow. 
And the other point is that with high flow, maybe we need to, to nebulize some patients and how we should do that. We already know that the higher the flow, the lower the deposition of the drug in the lung. This is also well exemplified in this picture where the relation between the inhaled dose and the ratio of high flow gas uh, of high flow nasal cannula gas flow to patients inspiratory flow is represent and the inhaled peak dose was achieved when the high flow nasal cannula gas flow was between 0.1 and 0.5 of the patient inspiratory flow so again the lower the liberate flow, the lower the liberate flow, sorry, the higher the dose. But with that, I'm not saying that you need to decrease the flow when you are delivering high flow, because remember, you the, 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 the effects of high flow are clearly flow dependent. So if you have a tremendously severely hypoxemic patient, which is who is stable with high flow, with 50 liters of high flow and FiO2 of 0.7, I would never decrease the flow to give a nebulization. I would suggest to increase the dose of the drug that you put inside the nebulizer. We will see it later. And comparing vibrating mesh nebulizers with jet nebulizers, what we see is the lung deposition with BMN is significantly higher than with jet nebulization. So BMN provided a greater aerosol delivered compared to the jet nebulizer at the medium flow rates. And this is what I was talking about, the importance of the dose. If you increase the dose, you can have the same effect without decreasing the flow of the uh, nasal cannula. So again, and I think it's important, I would never decrease the do the flow in the acute phase of hypoxemic acute respiratory failure to deliver any nebulized drug. I would increase the dose that I place inside the, nebula the nebulizer in order to achieve the same clinical effect without losing the effect that I have with high flow nasal cannula. This is a, a, a paper that was published by the group of Stefan Ehrman that they uh, include uh, 25 patients comparing three different strategies. Remove high flow and nebulize using a jet nebulizer without a with a mask, or maybe keeping high flow at a medium flow rate with a, with a BMN, or maybe only leaving high flow without any nebulization. The primary endpoint was change in uh, force expired volume after one second. And what they observe is that uh, salbutamol delivery with BMN during high flow nasal therapy induced similar bronchodilation compared to uh, jet nebulization without mask. But with this, you don't need to interrupt the treatment with high flow to deliver the inhaled medication, which is also important. Because if you ask to the patient, and you don't have to ask to the, to the kids, kids or child never lie. And this is a, a, a study performed in infants with uh, moderate uh, bronchiolitis, where they compare nebulizations via BMN with high flow or jet nebulizer with face mask. And they ask about comfort and satisfaction. And they observed that BMI in line during high flow was associated with an increase of level of comfort and, satis and satisfaction compared with jet nebulizer. So what is the current guidance of aerosol therapy in COVID-19? 
Well, I think that all the uh, several organizations agree on the fact that there is insufficient evidence to classify nebulizer therapy as a nitrosol generating procedure by itself that is, is associated with transmission of COVID-19. In fact, I, I've shown you previously in some slides that there is no evidence that supports the fact that if you use a PPE correctly and you perform the technique correctly, there is an increased risk of transmission of the infection. But it's important, as I said, to make it correctly, which means probably to use a mesh nebulizer in ventilated patients and try, and also in high flow patients, and try to keep the system close, not disconnect every time that you have to, to, to um, start the nebulization uh, again. Keeping the system closed and using mesh nebulizer, you clearly decrease the risk of potential viral transmission to the healthcare workers. And at the very early of the primary wave, either of the first wave of the pandemic, we uh, publish a clinical consensus of four Spanish scientific societies uh, that uh, they took also into account recommendations regarding the use of nebulization and aerosol therapy when it was needed in COVID-19 patients. And we, at that time, it was 12th of April, I think that it was published of 2020, we recommend the use of vibrating mesh nebulizers. In fact, we disadvise the use of jet nebulizers for all the reasons that I have previously explained, not only for the improvement in drug deposition, but also in lowering the risk of viral transmission to the healthcare workers. And in, it's important to highlight the fact that if you want to improve the lung deposition of the drug and you are nebulizing using high flow as probably happened with mechanically ventilated patient and you are using a vibrating mesh nebulizer, it should be placed at the dry side of the uh, heated humidifier. And these um, recommendations have been also uh, reported in other uh, papers. Uh, they are mainly the same, prefer mesh, mesh nebulizers using an aseptic technique, play, place the nebulizer at the inlet of the humidifier, close the reservoir cap after use, use larger cannulas, but be careful with that because even though you, 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 you probably increase the deposition of the drug in the lung, maybe are less tolerated. And if you want to keep the patient on high flow, you need the patient to be comfortable. So if to use larger cannula implies that the patient is less comfortable, I would not use larger cannula and I would suggest to keep with the cannula that you are using and increase again the dose that you are putting inside the nebulizer. And I it's my opinion, I maybe I'm wrong, I would not suggest never to decrease the flow rates during aerosol therapy. In fact, you have always to titrate the, glass, the gas flow based on patient's response and tolerance. But keeping in mind that the effect of high flow is totally flow dependent. So the higher the flow, the higher the effect you will have. And this is what will make the patient uh, less risky to be intubated. What is true is that you don't have to discontinue the technique during the demobilization and, and please do not place an aerosol mask on the top of high flow nasal cannula. It, it, 
should not be uh, uh, recommended. And the uh, Society of Aerosols in Medicine provide also uh, uh, sort of recommendations that uh, should be used in the year of COVID-19, which are uh, more or less the same that we have been reported previously. The first is use the PPE for aerosol and droplet protection. Uh, in fact, you have to use the PPE to go inside the room of a COVID-19 patient. Uh, have patients wear a simple mask uh, when possible. This uh, clearly limits the amount of fugitive emissions that uh, comes uh, that are exhaled by the patient. Put a fil place a filter on the exhalation port of the of the uh, ventilator. Start, try to keep the circuit closed as much as you can. Try to not open it because then um, you will have more amount of fugitive emissions. And if it is a non-intubated patient and maybe he's not in high flow, please use a mouthpiece to decrease again the fugitive uh, uh, emissions. So I think that more or less I'm on time and, and I would like to uh, summarize uh, with these four points which I think that are the most important points that we can discuss uh, at the end of the, of the presentations. I, I really think that uh, some COVID-19 patients may benefit from high flow. I'm sure that the pandemics without high flow would have been much worse for all of us, not for the patients, for the patients, for the doctors and for everybody. The, the outcomes would, wouldn't have been uh, the same. Uh, these patients, however, need to be uh, closely monitored to detect as early as possible any clinical deterioration and to not delay any needed intubation, which is something that also will worsen the outcomes of the patients. That data regarding the risk of viral transmission to healthcare workers is scarce, but to date, um, when they are used, adequate PPE and EPO filters are mandatory. Uh, we have no relevant data that there is a risk, but we have to be correctly protected, otherwise this risk would increase substantially. And if aerosol therapy is needed during high flow, vibrating mesh nebulizers should be used preferably placed at the dry side of the humidifier. So thank you very much for your attention and I would be very happy to take any questions that you may have regarding the presentation. Thank you very much.